I missed the quiz. What? Well, I've been asking questions, but nobody answers other than Seb. Seb passed. You got an A. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let's uh, let's continue. So, until now, as I said, really, I didn't tell you anything new. Uh, in a sense that I, I mean, I don't know how much I told you things that were new to you, but th this is all kind of uh, what is a classic understanding of uh, um, uh, uh, generalization bounds for uh, convex problems and, and uh, mirror descent. Um, not that what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes is, is so new either, uh, but but that was kind of more to set up the stage of what you mean in terms of optimization, and uh, we're. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking also about the problems, the sort of problems we started with, these underdetermined problems. So, in particular, just remind ourselves where we are. We are talking about problems of minimizing the training error, and where the number of uh, parameters uh, uh, d, or it's sometimes going to be p, is much, much bigger than the number of examples. So, the problems are underdetermined. There are typically many global optima uh, that have zero error. Okay? So, I mean, this doesn't this is safe, There's, you can get zero error, but we are going to look at a situation where you, you can actually get zero error, and you can get zero error in many ways. Um, and uh, we're going to optimize, maybe using stochastic, but just think of it as this batch uh, optimization using some geometry. Uh, and we're going to convert to some global optima W infinity. So this is, you can think of it as the limit of your optimization procedure. So you're going to optimize all the way to convergence. So you're going to look at the limit of your optimization uh, procedure, the inf infinite iterate. Uh, that is definitely going to be a global optima. And we're going to ask which global optima. Okay? So let's start with the simplest possible uh, problem, which is least squares. So we're just optimizing an underdetermined least square problem. Right? So it's... Uh, um, you know, a least square problem with many, many more uh, uh, dimensions of variables and equations. Okay? So again, there, there are many solutions here, but the question is, if we optimize these, squ these least square problems starting from zero, which of these many uh, uh, solutions will we get to? Which? Closest to Euclidean to initialization. In particular, initialize to zero, if we, we start in zero, we're just going to get to the minimum norm solution. Okay? So, so this is probably the, the simplest example of implicit bias of uh, uh, optimization for undetermined systems. This is an undetermined system, many global optima, gradient descent, converges to a very uh, uh, specific uh, uh, reasonable solution, the minimum norm solution. Now, it's very easy to see why. One way to see why is that we're going to stay in the span of the data, and the unique solution that's spanned by the data is, in fact, the minimum norm solution. But I'm actually going to say the exact same thing in a much more complicated way, uh, because we're going to see many other proofs that are going to use the same basic uh, proof structure. So the way we're going to argue it is, one, we're going to say that the, uh, the iterates stay in the span of the data. So in the span of the data, they span in a manifold that can be characterized this way. In this case, it's just a flat manifold. And the way to verify that the solutions stay in this manifold is because at any point in this manifold, the... Um, the, uh, the gradient is tangent to this manifold, which means that if I'm already in this manifold, I'm getting step in the direction of the, it's to going in infinitesimal step in the direction of the gradient, then I'm actually going to stay in the manifold. So at least this works if I'm doing infinitesimal steps. In this case, since the manifold is flat, it's even going to work if I take finite steps. It's going to work for any step size. Okay? Um, okay, and now, so this tells us where the solution lives. Now, we're optimizing this optimization problem, but I'm claiming that what we're actually doing is optimizing this purple optimization problem. How can I convince you that you go to a global optimum of the purple optimization problem? So what we're going to do is we're going to write the KKT condition, KK condition of the purple optimization problem. Okay? So in this case, the KKT conditions, we have uh, uh, the primal feasibility and stationarity. Okay? And nu, nu is the dual variable. And I want to emphasize, these are not the KKT condition problems of the problem which gradient descent is operating on. Okay? So the K, gradient descent is operating on this optimization problem, these are the KKD conditions of the, pro of the implicit problem I'm claiming that you're actually optimizing. Okay? So what I, wanna, what I need to convince you is you're actually going to satisfy these KKD conditions. Okay. So the first condition, primal optimality, uh, the, sorry, primal feasibility, is, gonna op is, is easy to say because if we actually uh, reach a global minimum of my optimization objective, then xw is equal to y and we f satisfy uh, it is going to hold in global minima. Okay? So we reach a global minima, this is going to hold. But also, if you look at this condition, what is this? this? As long as we're in this manifold, any point in this manifold satisfies the stationarity condition. Okay? So all along optimization, we always satisfy stationarity. In which global optimal, we also uh, uh, satisfy primal feasibility. Hence, we satisfy the KKD conditions uh, of this purple problem. And we know that once we, if we run gradient descent and actually converge to a global minima, we will actually be solving this purple optimization problem. Okay? 
And this is, uh, and again, this proof thing that we'll see, well, depending on how much time we see, we we'll, we'll might see the actual proof again, or at least I'll mention you can prove things this way a few more times. Where we're showing that by following, uh, by doing gradient descent, you are implicitly uh, going to satisfy KKT and T conditions for some problems. So, so what we actually have to do in order to figure out what is implicit uh, uh, bias is frequently work backwards to see what uh, do we satisfy when we do optimization algorithm and ask ourselves, oh, what are these KKD conditions, KKD conditions off? Okay. okay. Um, and as we said, in this case, sorry? What is D? No, this is a dual variable. Oh, okay. Okay, but, okay, so I want to satisfy for some new. Okay, so we're going to satisfy with S equals new. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, now in this case, there's something very special happening, just one second, is that since the manifold is flat, then I can take finite steps, and I can even use momentum and all kinds of things like that. This will soon fail because as soon as this manifold is not going to be flat, the manifold of gradients in the center is not going to be flat. In order to stay on it, I have to take infinitesimal steps because otherwise, kind of a jump off it, off it, and I also am not allowed to do use momentum. I do momentum, I kind of do ski jumps and go off the manifold. Okay, well, as long as we're fine, we're flat, and everything is fine. Yes, offer. So how does this depend on the initialization? Uh, okay, so in, uh, if I change the initialization, then this manifold would be different. Okay, so here I, uh, and so, so I have to, in order to say that I stay in the manifold, I guess I have to say two things. One is I, that I, the gradient is tangent in the manifold everywhere, and that I actually start in this manifold. Okay, right. Okay, great. So, um, okay, so, the, the, so let's see, so this is what we analyzed so far is, is least square problems with gradient descent. So let's just stick with still uh, least square problems. Okay, uh, which uh, really is just, you know, you can think of it as convex learning problems with a squared loss objective. Okay, um, and now see, we, can we develop this vocabulary of, for each optimization algorithm to ask the question of where is this optimization algorithm going to converge to? Okay, so for gradient descent, we converge to the minimum Euclidean norm solution. Um, what about if you do mirror descent? Okay, so if you do mirror descent, and we start at you know, the equivalent of zero, which is kind of the global optimal of psi. So this is a good place to start because if you're, Implicit bias, if, if your uh, bias is given by psi, if your psi is kind of, your, if you think of psi as your prior, then well, where you should start is kind of a priori, the minimum of psi is a good place to start, okay? Um, so if you do mirror descent starting from the minimum of psi and you're gonna converge, you're gonna converge to a global minima, but which global minima are you gonna converge to? Any guesses? Sorry? Minimum psi. Minimum psi, right? So it's just minimum, okay, the minimum psi solution. If you start in a point which is not an psi, what you're gonna to converge to is the, mi the minimum Bergman divergence to uh, your initial point, but I don't like Bergman divergence, so that's why I started, it, it, uh, I started here. Okay, and the way to see this is exactly the same proof as, uh, uh, as we did before, but now, um, you know, you, you know, basically, I'm not, I'm not gonna uh, show the proof, but again, I mean, you have to, you can show that you, the iterates lie in some manifold, and if you intersect that manifold with the, globe, with the uh, uh, with global optimality, then, then you get a KKT conditions for this optimization problem. Okay, so that means that, uh, so this is what you get from mirror descent. What about natural gradient descent? So natural gradient descent, at least if the step size goes to zero, we know that natural gradient descent is the same as mirror descent, and so again, it'll go to the same thing. Okay? But here we already see that we have to start taking the step size to zero. If you do natural gradient descent with finite step sizes, then I don't know what you're gonna get to. And in fact, what you're gonna get to depends on your step sizes. So here and here I could take any step size policy, any step size policy that will ensure convergence, okay? Uh, but now we start seeing that it's, in order to be able to, to exactly characterize where you get to, it's important that the step size are infinitesimally small. Yes? So the statement you're making here is that if near the descent converges to a global minimum, it's, then it's that, it's that one. But you're yeah, not but, us the, the but mirror descent, as long as your step sizes are reasonable, mirror descent. So if you step, yeah, so if, for example, if you take, um, <coughs> It's easy to derive conditions on your step sizes here. So if your step sizes are such than true convergence, or your step sizes are uh, um, not are uh, square, uh, square summable but not summable, or something like that. I mean, depending on now your exactly your conditions and oh, this is smooth. Sorry. If your step size you have a fixed step size that's uh, less than the uh, smoothness parameter of this, then you'll converge. That's that's not a problem here. Establishing convergence is easy. Convergence to a global this is a convex optimization problem. Okay, so convergence to global minima is very easy here to establish. Okay, does that, okay? Uh, and in general, later on we'll talk about problems where maybe it's harder to establish convergence to global optima, and mostly we're not gonna be, that's Jason, that's not me. I mean, that, that was the talks uh, yesterday and this morning, right? We're gonna assume that we converge to global minima and ask which global minima, but again, in these cases, it's, the convergence to global minima is very easy to establish. Okay, 
Um, so here we already see that we study the step size goes to zero, which already makes things a bit messier. We also saw something similar, I mean, we didn't see this result yet, we just mentioned it in the introduction, that if we do gradient standard of factorization, so we write, you know, if we have the same problem, but now we think of W as a metrics, uh, you know, just arrange it as a metrics and optimize the factorization, then we sort of get to the uh, minimum, uh, minimum, um, Euclid minimum nuclear norm solution, but now we have to take the step size to zero, where it's in taking the initialization to zero, which is a problem because it's zero as a saddle point, so I can't actually initialize at zero. I have to initialize infinitesimally close to zero. Things start to be a miss. Okay? Um, but let's even go back to, uh, this maybe is ex not exactly convex, so let's go back to still convex things. What about Adam or Adagrad? We started talking about Adagrad. Uh, at, um, we talked about Adagrad at the beginning, so there's a big difference in generalization behavior between Adagrad and, Euclid and uh, gradient set. What happens if I take the least square problem and optimize it with Adagrad? Okay, I'm going to get to global minima. Which global minima will I get to? Anybody know? Guesses? I should at least have a guess. So there's a good guess here. Okay, so the, the kind of guess that you're supposed to have. The, X, uh, the, norm, the norm from X. Which norm? Oh, the norm from X. Okay, so, okay. so not exactly. So what Adegrad is trying to do actually is optimize with respect to L infinity norm. So kind of your guess should be that you minimize the L infinity, you get to the minimum L infinity norm solution. But actually that's true, that turns out to be not true. It's only true in very, very special cases. Even, in that, even if you take the step size to zero, you know, uh, okay, well here it's not exactly clear what it means to take the step size to zero, but it turns out that this is actually very delicate and you can't actually characterize. And uh, you know, the, the, the solution you're gonna get to depends very much on the parameters of Adegrad. So even for this very simple problem already for Adegrad, we can't exactly characterize the, the bias. Let's do, do look at something even simpler, which is steepest ascent with respect to some norm. So again, we're gonna take, um, least square and optimize it with steepest descent with respect to some norm. What, are we, what solution are we going to get to? Any guesses? What? Well, it shouldn't be the dual norm, right? It'd be the norm is the norm on W. Right, so we're talking, we're talking about the solution we want to characterize in terms of the W we get to. So maybe a good guess is we get to the minimum, minimum norm solution with respect to the same norm we're taking steepest descent. So that would have been a good guess. That was also our guess, but the problem is that's wrong, okay? So, it's hard to characterize what you get to. In fact, in some sense, you cannot characterize what you get to, but it's definitely not the minimum norm solution with respect to that norm. Even if you take the step size to zero, so even if you do gradient flow, if you do, you know, do this in the, the, the um, continuous time uh, limit, you're not gonna actually get to the minimum, minimum norm solution. So when we saw this first, we were a bit surprised, but then we realized, wait, actually we knew this before. Because um, if you look at, at coordinate descent, coordinate descent is steepest descent with respect to L1 norm, and we know that for coordinate descent, it's kind of related to L1 minimization, but it's not exactly L1 minimization. So think of the lasso. So uh, looking at the uh, uh, least square problem with L1 regularizer is exactly the lasso. And we know that Lars, what's Lars? Lars is essentially coordinate descent, uh, uh, the coordinate descent of the least square problem, the specific coordinate descent. Again, coordinate descent is ill-defined. And we know that Lars is related to the lasso, but it's not equal to the lasso. It's not the same thing. I mean, it's only the same thing under you know, some very special conditions that never hold. Okay? And so even for this problem, we already knew that we, you know, in retrospect, that you're not gonna get to the, um, to the minimum solution. In fact, it's the case that for any norm, you're not gonna get any non-quadratic norm, you're not gonna get to the minimum norm solution. Okay? And so what we see here is even for least square problems, which I thought was kind of the simplest to analyze, it's actually difficult to exactly characterize the implicit bias. <coughs> What about the LP norms? I mean, shouldn't it be you, you follow from the mirror descent result? No, because mirror descent is not the same as steepest descent. So if you do, so if you do, if you do infinitesimal, okay. So for LP norm, uh, okay. For LP norm, if you do infinitesimal step size, okay. So if you do uh, LP norm infinitesimal step size, then that's natural. That's the same as. Uh, 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 let me think about it. No, it's not the same. No, 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 it's not the same. Because remember that the, 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 the divergence of the LP norm is not the, L, the LP norm. So if you look at the, right? And so natural gradient descent with respect to the LP norm, uh, to the Hessian of the LP norm is different than steepest descent with respect to the LP norm, okay? And nobody does natural gradient descent with respect, uh, nobody, the, nobody that I know except for Surya when she did these experiments, actually does uh, steepest descent with respect to the Hessian uh, of, you know, sorry, natural gradient descent with respect to the Hessian of the LP norm, okay? Yes? In this 
example, if you do an early stopping, do you get a trade-off? OK, so that's an excellent question. We'll talk about it a bit later. And the short answer is I don't know, and I'm very interested. So in particular, I mean, this is a question to the audience. Maybe there's an answer here. I mean, I, I'm, can you get generalization guarantees for early stopping of Lars in terms of the L1 norm? So we tried, we, we looked at that. Um, so we're saying, yes, I think we looked at it, we're not, we're an inconclusive, okay? So, so that's an excellent question. So if you do early, if you do uh, follow the regularization path of the, if you do less so, so follow the regularization path of the L1 norm, do explicit regularization, we know how to get good generalization guarantees. And what happens if you do LARS, which is your know, steepest ascent with respect to the L1 norm, with early stopping, can you get generalization guarantees of that with respect to the L1 norm? Anybody know the answer? I don't, but I, we looked, and I thought that the answer was known. We couldn't find it. Yeah? You can with Adaboost. You can with Adaboost. So we'll get to later with Adaboost, and we'll understand why you can with Adaboost. OK, it's, uh, it's, it's different. OK. Um, OK, yes. Uh, when, do you, when do you say uh, step size goes to zero? It means like, you know, we have more iteration, but with like, you know, tiny changes? Yeah, so step size goes to zero. What I really mean, formally, what I mean by step size going to zero is this continuous time limit. So the, the solution of the OD that we had before, gradient flow, or the flow version of these things. Also, also like if we choose the steps um, based on, for example, some line search strategies like multiple. Ah, uh, okay. Then, then it's much more complicated. Oh. Uh, so yeah, line searches. I don't know how to analyze. Uh, we'll talk about it. Actually, we'll we'll talk about it a bit later in about three slides. Okay. Okay. So this is for squared loss. Um, so we saw that squared loss is actually kind of annoying to characterize. Fortunately, the squared loss is not the loss we usually use for draining deep networks. The loss we usually use is, again, the cross-entropy loss, uh, which really is just the logistic loss, okay, or the multi-class logistic loss. And so what happens for the logistic loss? So let's think of the same problem we had before. So now I can talk about a neural net, right? It's this very nice, simple neural net with a single unit, also known as logistic regression. Okay? So we solve just linear logistic regression. Uh, uh, and again, uh, what's going to happen here? So the, I'm interested in the overdetermined, uh, sorry, in the underdetermined case. So in the underdetermined case, um, there are many dimensions. In particular, there are many uh, ways of separating the data. So many ways uh, of uh, um, uh, there are many ways of separating the data. And what we ask is, what happens when you actually do gradient descent on the logistic loss? Okay. So what what happens when you do gradient descent on the logistic loss? Where 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 will I converge to? Where is where is is the question clear? So I'm, I'm taking this objective. I'm going to start somewhere, and I'm doing gradient descent with, on, uh, on this objective with respect to W. Where is W going to converge to? If the problem is then you're separable. What? What? You want to go and you want to say infinity. Yeah, OK. It's not going to converge. It's going to diverge, OK? Because um, the, the infimum of the loss here is 0. And this is an important point. The infimum of the loss is 0, but it's not attainable. OK, I can drive the loss to 0 by taking W to infinity, but I'm never actually going to reach 0. Okay? So I can do that in the direction of any, any linear separator. If I have a linear separator, and I'm taking w in the direction, or w that defines this linear separator, so orthogonal direction, it's going to have finite loss. And if I take w to infinity here, I'm going to drive the loss to 0. Okay? So w is actually going to diverge. And uh, this is a very important point, because people talk about the norm that you get, the norm of the weights you get by training, uh, uh, you take a neural net, and train it, and get zero error. And then you talk about the norm of the weights at convergence. What does that mean? That there's no norm of the weights in convergence, right? The, the, the weights are going to go to infinity. Okay? The norm you get, the only thing that determines which norm you get is how far, you know, how long you spend optimizing. Okay? So, what about so the cross entropy loss? what? How about cross entropy loss? This is, this is the cross entropy loss. I thought this the. This is the cross entropy loss. The cross entropy with respect to a softmax model. Logistic. The cross entropy with respect to soft, soft, softmax right. model is exactly the multi-class logistic regression. Okay, so this is. A uni in logistic regression means only a single output. So there's a cross entropy loss to a softmax model uh, where one class is given by the output and the other is given by the negative output. Okay, th this is exactly a cross. This is the same thing would happen for the, the cross entropy loss, which is exactly multi class logistic regression. Okay? okay, so we're going to diverge to infinity. But it doesn't matter if we diverge to infinity because what we care about is only what the separator is. So rather than asking what is W going to converge to, which it's not, it's going to diverge, we're asking what is it, which direction is it going to diverge to. In other words, which the nearest separator is going to converge to. Okay? So I can get this uh, uh, zero error in many different directions, any di direction I actually separate the data in. Okay? But which is the direction I get if I actually, in all of these directions are legitimate directions in terms of you know, different directions that are going to get the infimum. This doesn't have an optimum, but get an infimum of the problem. Okay? Which direction do I get where, where I actually use gradient descent? OK? 
Okay. So the question clear now? Okay, so what? Yes. Max margin, right. So what you get is exactly a hard margin SVM solution. Max margin with respect to your Euclidean node. Okay, so that's, um, um, and now we can actually characterize it very, uh, how, actually, how am I doing the time? When am I supposed to finish? So I have another hour from now. Okay, so just trying to decide whether to do the proof or not. Okay, so and what we can get here is we're going to get to the max margin, but you can even say what we get much more finely. What we get is uh, we converge to the max margin. More specifically, asymptotically, the solution is going to look like this. It's going to be look like the max margin solution times log t plus some error term which is going to stay bounded. So in particular, as t goes to infinity, this term is dominated and we're going to converge to the max margin solution. Okay? And this is a much stronger uh, uh, result than the type of results we saw for the L2 case. In particular, this holds for any initialization in, with even finite step size, any, any uh, finite step size. Okay? And it holds, and what's special here, it holds not only for the logistic loss, What's important here is the loss has a tight exponential tail, right? So, so logistic loss, when, when the predictions go to infinity, when z goes to infinity, this behaves essentially as e to the negative z. So any loss that behaves as a limit is e to the negative z. So in particular, many of the results I'm going to show you are, I'm going to prove them for the x plus, e to the negative z, and I'm going to think about it in terms of logistic loss. Because for separable problems, the behavior of the limit is, is only determined by the tail of this loss, which looks like e to the negative z. So in terms of separable data, the logistic loss and the x plus are, are the same at the limit. OK, so um, maybe I'll very quickly go uh, through this proof uh, just to get the, the flavor of things. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, assume we converge to some direction w infinity. I mean, you can show that you, you can prove that you converge to it, but we're going to uh, here assume that, that you converge to some limit. So that means that the solution is given some uh, then it is asymptotically by some increasing function gt times w infinity plus some rho where rho is smaller than gt, right? Because w infinity is, is the limit. So now we just have to figure out what is this w infinity, okay? So since the problem is separable, then we're going to drive the loss. Uh, 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 the, 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 eventually, everything is going to be, we're going to separate all the data points. And so uh, far enough from, uh, from zero, we definitely have the w infinity uh, times x, I set all the labels here for one for convenience, is definitely going to be positive. Okay? So let's look at how the, the gradient of the loss looks like. So the gradient of the loss, I mean, we're thinking of the x plus instead of the logistic loss. So the gradient of the x plus is just the x plus itself. So we have e to the negative prediction times the data points. Okay? So now the thing is that since I have something that looks like this, that as, uh, um, uh, as gt in, uh, that scales all things increases, like as they go further and further away, then only the, 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 only the points that are closest to the margin, that have the smallest values of uh, w infinity xi are going to dominate this, uh, uh, this exponent, uh, this sum, because their, their values are going to be infinitely larger than anything else. Okay? So that means that the gradient is spanned only by the points that have minimal value of uh, w times xi. And I'm going to keep adding them back to x. So that means that my iterates are also going to be dominated only by those points. So that means that the gradient, so that means that my iterator is spanned by, by what are these points? They're exactly the support vectors. They're spanned by the points that are kind of have, are, are, uh, uh, have the minimal uh, margin value that are on the margin. Okay? And now again, if I, I can use that, and I'm going to be very quick here, but I can use that in order to construct the KKD and D conditions for the hard margin SVM solution. And so argue that it gets to the max margin SVM solution. Okay, so what does that tell us? So I, I'm going to, maybe I'll take questions later because, okay, so the fact that we get the hard margin SVM solution here is maybe not so surprising. I mean, that was somebody's guess here. It was also our kind of first guess. I mean, if you ask a random person off the street, they'll probably tell you that is their first guess, uh, depending what street you, uh, you live on. I'm sure if that's true for some streets. Um, okay, but, but you can already see much more fine things than that. So one question we can ask is, well, it's going to the max margin, but how fast is the action, uh, are we getting there? How fast are we? We're maximizing the margin by how fast? And the solution is, the, the answer is exceedingly slow. Okay? If, the, the max, if we ask how quickly we get to the max margin, we're getting there as 1 over log t. Okay? So if you look at the, the, the sort of, the margin of our, uh, uh, so both if you look at if, uh, how quickly we're getting close to the max margin solution, or if we're asking how is our, the margin behaving relative to the max margin, they're both going down as one over log t. 
Okay? Contrast it with the loss, the loss is going down much, much faster. The loss is going down in 1 over t. Okay? And this is already interesting because it means that if we really care, if, there were, if our, we're thinking we're doing, uh, we're minimizing logistic loss, but really the reason we're minimizing logistic loss, and maybe not the reason, but implicitly what's going on is we're maximizing the margin, then in order to get a good margin, we have to drive that logistic loss extremely, extremely low. So that already explains why maybe when you train your neural net, and your, your training loss goes down from 10 to the negative 4 to 10 to the negative 5. Okay? And while the training loss goes down from 10 to the negative 4 to 10 to the negative 5, then your, uh, your test error improves. It improves maybe go, drops from 7% you know, to 5%. Okay? Why did your training loss, your test loss go, go down from 7% to 5%? It did not go down by 2% because your fit to the data improved by 10 to the negative 5. Okay? That's not like you already fit your data perfectly. I mean, that's not the reason it improved. Why you can say maybe it improved is because you're finding you're improving the margin. Your regularization term improved. But the margin goes down so much slower than training loss that this suggests why it's important to drive the training loss so ridiculously, continue optimizing the training loss for so long after it's already like barely changing. Okay? And you can see this, uh, okay, I'm going to skip it. You can see this uh, uh, empirically. Okay. Um, Okay, so now uh, let's look at the. So we saw that for, for squared loss, uh, it was kind of difficult to get a precise characterization of the, uh, of the implicit bias for some problems. Let's now ask the exact same question, but for, uh, for logistic or logistic type losses. So we say that we have um, uh, you know, one linear unit, so it's linear logistic regression, you get the hard margin SVM solution. Uh, and uh, if you have multiple, uh, if you have a multi class problem, so you have multi class logistic regression, you're going to get just a multi class SVM solution. Um, um, but now if we ask what happens if we do steepest ascent. So again, we're doing the exact same problem as uh, you just solve a logistic regression problem. We're only going to change the optimization algorithm. Okay, so now instead of solving it with gradient descent, we're going to do it, solve it with steepest descent with respect to some norm. So before, if we, stopped, uh, if we solved uh, uh, least square regression with steepest descent with respect to some norm, then I don't know what we got. But if we solve logistic regression with respect to some norm, we get exactly what we'd expect, which is the max margin solution with respect to that norm. So the solution that actually gets an output of margin of one and minimizes that norm. Okay? So we have a, a, a much tighter connection between the, the optimization geometry when using steepest ascent and, uh, the, uh, um, and, and the implicit bias. And again, uh, we can, it's particularly insightful to look at the special case of coordinate descent. So for coordinate descent, which is steepest descent with respect to L1 norm, what this tells us is that we'll converge to the max L1 margin. And actually, the way I'm presenting things here is not, his, not uh, uh, historically, not reflective of the historical development, because the historical development actually started with coordinate descent. And in fact, the, the, the technique that I showed you for, uh, uh, for establishing uh, the implicit bias for L2 actually uh, was derived from the techniques developed for studying uh, coordinate descent with respect to L1. Why were people studying coordinate descent with respect to L1? Because at the boost is exactly coordinate descent on the x plus, with, uh, uh, is exactly coordinate descent with the x plus. So steepest descent with respect to L1 on the x plus. And that was uh, known already by, uh, um, you know, from the, the work I mentioned before by Peter and co authors, that that tended to get uh, to minimize the L1 norm. And so we can understand generalization in terms of the L1 norm. But now there's some subtleties here because. Um, uh, what Adaboost exactly is, is coordinate descent, uh, 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 coordinate descent and uh, X plus with exact line search. And that actually does not converge to the max L1 norm, uh, to the max L1 margin solution, does not actually minimize the L1 norm. And that was pointed out by uh, Cynthia, um, Cynthia Ruthin, Rob Shapiri, and actually I'm not, I don't know the middle. Okay. But Ingrid Nibush, thank you. Okay. Um, so they showed that actually, even though Adebus tends to minimize the L1 norm and doesn't exactly. And then um, uh, Matush uh, uh, showed that you, it's true that with exact line search, you don't exactly get the, the, the uh, uh, max L1 margin. But by slightly fixing Adebus, you can actually get exactly max L1 margin. You can do that even just by slightly shrinking the step sizes. Or what we saw here is by just taking a fixed step size. So if you do Adebus with a fixed step size, you will exactly get to the max L1 margin. And the, the proof technique we showed in here is exactly just Matush's uh, uh, proof technique modified to a general norm. Is that a fair statement? Or? Okay. Um, okay, so, um, and now uh, we can also see other problems that before we had a problem with, which is this metrics completion, uh, uh, metric factorization problem. 
I, I'm, we're going to, I'm actually not sure we're going to see the proof for it. Um, so again, for the metrics factorization problem, where before we kind of got minimum nuclear norm, but only kind of because we couldn't prove it, only in special cases, and only if we had started infinitesimally close to zero, and infinitesimal step size, and it was a miss. And with the X plus, we can do the same thing. We can ask what is, you know, we have a, a problem with the metrics argument. We're writing this factorization. We're solving the logistic loss. So think of it as like one bit, uh, um, uh, one bit matrix completion or, or, or something like that, like matrix com completion for classification where you just have up-down measurements for each entry. Uh, and now in a much more robust way, you actually get to the max trace norm margin. So minimize the trace norm subject to an output margin of one. And in some sense, the reason it's much easier to analyze the, these, the logistic loss or generally these exponentially decaying losses as opposed to the squared losses, there's nothing special here about the squared loss or logistic itself. The big difference here is whether the, the loss looks like this and has a unique finite minimum or whether it's monotonically decaying to infinity. And the reason is that if it, the loss is monotonically decaying to infinity, then that means, as, as we saw, the solution is going to go to infinity. So you're going to end up infinitely far away from the origin. If you're going to end up infinitely far away from the origin, it doesn't matter at which finite point you started. I mean, any point you start with from the perspective of where you end up is at the origin. Okay? And so the asymptotics here are much easier and much cleaner. Also, the step size don't matter as long as you have a figure. So this is why exact line search is a problem, because then the step sizes might be very, like, might actually increase as you go further away from the origin. But as long as you're taking a fixed step size, then eventually when you, you, know, when you finish your optimization, your step size is going to look minuscule compared to our, where you are. So the asymptotics are much more convenient in this case than in this case. And here, in this case, you're going to end up in a finite solution and all these finite fluctuations at the beginning can affect what you're doing by a lot. Okay? Okay. Um, okay. So, so far what we uh, talked about is, we didn't talk about learning in the last few slides, all we talked about is just a pure algorithmic question of I'm going to use some algorithm, namely, uh, you know, say, st uh, uh, steepest descent with respect to some norm or gradient descent or something like that. What is going to be the output of my algorithm? Okay, I, this is a determini deterministic uh, empirical algorithm. What is going to be the output? How can we relate that to learning? How can we get uh, learning guarantees from that? Well, I mean, once we understand what the algorithm is doing, so once we understand that our optimization algorithm, think of A as our optimization algorithm, actually returns the minimum psi solution with respect to some psi, like the L1, the L2, the L1, something like that. You can think of this maybe as a margin loss. Then, at least in the realizable case, you can get generalization guarantees in terms of the complexity of the sublevel sets of psi. So in particular, you can say that uh, you can bound uh, the, uh, uh, the, the population loss of uh, the output of the algorithm in terms of the Rademacher complexity of these sublevel sets. So it looks, you know, generally would look something like this with some complexity measure here that depends on your structure of psi. Okay? So that means, at least in the realizable case, we get a, you know, we understand the generalization, uh, what's going on here. Now, the question is what's going on in the non-realizable case. Okay, so in the non-realizable non case, and this is maybe goes back to what uh, Vitaly asked before, I mean, learning still makes sense, right? So in, in, maybe think of the realizable case as so the non-realizable case. Instead of thinking of can you get zero error, I think the better question is do you want to get zero error? So in the realizable case, you want to compete with some hypothesis W star that has zero error and also small psi. In the non-realizable case, the hypothesis I want to compete with is a, a simple hypothesis that has small psi, but it doesn't necessarily have zero error. I just want to compete with some hypothesis that has small error. Okay? So I want to get, preferably I want to learn some W that has error that's less than uh, the loss of W star plus some complexity measure that depends on W star. Okay? How can I get that? So I can get that by explicit regularization, how can I get that? Something like this, also with implicit regularization. So now there, there are kind of two basic options here. Uh, uh, or sorry, there are several basic options here. One is to say, oh, I want to compete with this W star that has small error, but still I'm going to do that by completely minimizing the training error. Okay, so that's interpolation learning. And Peter talked about it this yesterday, I think. Okay? And, and for that understanding, in terms of optimization, I supplied Peter everything he needs. I told him what my solution finds. I find the zero error solution that minimizes some psi. And now I can move, uh, pass this on to Peter, and now it's just Peter has to solve the interpolation learning problem. The problem is that we still don't understand the interpolation learning problem. I mean, we don't understand when we can exactly do interpolation learning. Um, we're working on that. Uh, but that's, you know, if, if what we're doing is interpolation learning, that would be satisfying. And actually, for deep learning, it seems that we are actually doing interpolation learning. And so maybe that is a satisfying answer here. So in terms of optimization, I just have to understand this zero error case. Okay? So you seem concerned? or oh, Okay. Okay. Uh, but let's still think of what can we do uh, if we do want to do, don't want to do interpolation learning. 
So if you don't want to do interpolation learning, what we probably want to do is early stopping. Okay? So what we probably want to do is not find a zero-hour solution. So how can we do optimization without finding a zero-hour solution? We're still going to optimize uh, uh, the empirical error with some optimization procedure, which is we're going to stop before we have zero error. Okay? How can we analyze that? So there are two ways to analyze that. Either um, I can exactly tell, try to characterize what is the output you'd get. So in the way I'd say it is, I can relate the optimization path, the solution you get if you do early stopping at different points, with the regularization path, the solutions you get if you do explicit regularization. And that would be in regularization interpretation or for early stopping. So I can tell you, oh, you're doing the early stopping. That exactly corresponds to this type of regularization. Okay? And we're going to see an example of that. I should say that another approach we can say is say, well, maybe what I'm doing with early stopping, it doesn't actually correspond exactly to regularizing, but it just generalizes the same. So this is kind of related to what we saw at the beginning. We saw that SGD doesn't actually solve the regularized DRM problem. It just generalizes the same. So maybe if I do early stopping, what I mean by early stopping, instead of doing stochastic gradient descent, I'm actually going to do batch gradient descent, but I'm going to stop the batch gradient descent before it actually gets zero error. So again, I'm gonna, I, maybe I'm going to get a solution that looks like this, but maybe I'm going to get a solution that's very different than it, but just generalizes it as well. Okay, okay so let's, let's look at uh, some examples. So first, um, let's see how we can relate the optimization path and the regularization path. And as far as I know, there's only one uh, example where we can really do that, uh, and that's for uh, uh, least square problems with gradient descent. Okay? So we're going to, again, look at this uh, least square problem. Uh, so the optimization path is just defined by these batch gradient descent iterations, okay? and we're going to relate it to the regularization path, which is defined by, by the actual minimizer, not, no, no algorithm going on here. I'm just looking at the minimizer of my empirical loss plus different values of uh, uh, regularization with different values of lambda. So for lambda equals zero, this is just the, the actual risk minimizer, and for lambda goes to, when lambda goes to infinity, this goes to zero. When lambda, go, lambda is equal to infinity, this is just zero. Okay, um, and the limit of these two things, so if I take, as we said, if I take lambda to zero, I don't have any regularization here, is the same as I'd get uh, uh, if t goes to uh, infinity here, then I'm going to get actually the minimum uh, norm, uh, sorry, a zero loss solution, but not just a zero loss solution, in both cases we know that we're going to get actually the minimum norm solution. Okay, here you're going to get the minimum norm solution because you're still going to, you know, it's, as long as you have, you're still going to have some preference to minimize the norm. And we saw that for gradient descent, we're also going to get the minimum norm solution. So the end point of the regularization path and optimization path are the same point. Can we also say that they're the same all along the way? So ideally, what we want to show is something like this, that wt is equal to w hat lambda with some relationship between t and lambda. Can we do that? Okay. So we sort of we can, or not we, but uh, actually uh, Ney and uh, Rosasco. But in order to do that, we cannot do that for a fixed t. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to do early stopping, but we're going to sort of randomize early stopping. So we're going to choose our stopping time at random. Okay, we're going to choose a stopping time at random following some geometric distribution. So um, uh, what... Uh, new? 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 What? Gregory. Gregory. <laughs> what Greg and Lorenzo, <laughs> Gregory and Lorenzo showed is that um, if you stop occurring in a random time based on geometric distribution, then... The, uh, the, early stopping, uh, the, the, the early stopping iterate, and the expectation here now is not over the data or anything. The expectation is only with respect to the stopping time, is exactly equal up to some scaling that very quickly goes to 1 to uh, the regularization path, where I can tell you exactly what, if you stop after expected time of t, it corresponds to lambda, which is roughly 1 over t. Or strictly speaking, 1 over eta t. So the step size also matters here. Okay? So in other words, then, then at least with randomized stopping, the regularization path exact, does exactly correspond to the optimization. The optimization path does exactly correspond to the regularization path. So doing the stopping is just the same as adding a regularization term. Okay? Um, so this is for uh, randomized stopping. You can also ask what happens if I don't do randomized stopping, if I do, if I just stop at some point. In, okay, I'm not, I mean, the answer is that you can also say what happens there, at least if you average the iterate with a certain averaging, which basically amounts to you know, doing, uh, truncating this expectation uh, at some point, and then you get an additional correction. And what you, get, what you get at that point is that you don't get exactly the optimization path. What you get is that after, uh, with, you know, with, with some averaging of the iterates, after t iterations, and again, this is going to be very close to 1 very quickly. Just ignore this term. What you get is this wt lambda, which is not exactly a point in the optimization path, but rather it, what happens if you optimize the regularized objective using t steps of gradient descent. Okay, so doing t steps of gradient descent without regularization 
corresponds to doing t steps of gradient descent with regularization. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, uh, the point is that we we we, uh, um, we kind of understand this, but we only understand this for least square problems with gradient descent. I'd really love to understand this actually more generally. In particular, from what as far as I know, we don't understand this even for uh, uh, maybe the, the second most interesting thing, which is uh, least square problems with coordinate descent. So uh, what happens, or even so, you know, if, if we look at uh, uh, stop uh, Lars early, or even for boosting, even for x plus with the coordinate descent. So for x plus, I, I mean, you mentioned early stopping. I don't know how to relate an early stopping iterate of uh, uh, how to get generalization guarantees for early stopping iterate of uh, add a boost before you're in the realizable case, like before you actually, have, you know, when, you're, when your training error is well above zero, to uh, the uh, to the performance of L1 regularized solution. In a non-parametric situation, you can do that. And so if you have a rich enough class that you guarantee it. But I, c I know how to do it if I stop yeah. after I already have zero training error, after the data is separable. No, no, no. In the case where it's not separable even, right? So in general, not. You, you can get consistency results. You can say that. Yeah, that but OK. But I don't. No, no. You can get. Right. But I don't know how to relate. No, I can get generalization guarantees. But I can't, I don't know how to relate the iterate to, right, to, right. to not, the, the... It's not talking about regularization, it's just talking about... Exactly, exactly, right, right. Quality exactly, right. Actually, so, uh, Rob, yes. Rob has a guarantee of this type. For, uh, he has a comparison between the, um, the solution you get after some number of iterations and the optimal solution subject to a norm constraint of log t. Okay, so I'll be, if you show me that later, I'd, I'd be happy to see that. Okay, so, um, okay, so... So as we said, we this is the, an approach that relates the uh, directly relates the, the regularization path optimization path. Another way to deal with early stopping is I mean um, is just get generalization guarantees after early stopping. And there has been um, uh, some work on that uh, both for boosting and for uh, 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 and for kernel ridge regression. In some sense, you can interpret some results on. on uh, 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 for greedy selection also is, is results in that for uh, uh, coordinate descent for uh, uh, least square problems. Uh, but I have to say that I, I mean, I, all, all of these results interpret things a bit differently and, and I don't think we have kind of a nice unified theory of, uh, of what's going on here. But anyway, maybe this is not so important because if we're doing interpolation learning anyway, then all this is sort of less relevant and we should be thinking about what happens when you do drive the training error to zero anyway. Okay, so that's uh, we're gonna, what we're going to focus on. And so, so far we only talked about shallow uh, convex problem in the remaining, like what, five minutes or something? What do we have, 35 minutes? Yeah. Remaining 35 minutes, we're finally going to uh, draw to deep, uh, uh, deep problems and see what's going on. So the first uh, deep problem we're going to uh, look at uh, is uh, my favorite deep learning problem, uh, which is of course metrics factorization. Uh, so metrics factorization is, is actually a deep learning problem uh, because it's a, uh, it corresponds to a two-layer network with linear transfer. Okay, so don't laugh. Uh, this is already a deep non-convex problem that exhibits many of the situations that happens in deep learning and has the distinct advantage that we actually have an understanding of what's going on there. Okay, um, okay. so we already saw this before. We're going to look at these... Uh, uh, this least square problem on uh, linear measurements over a metrics, we're going to parameterize the metrics as a, uh, a, a factorization, a full dimensional factorization, we're going to do gradient descent on u, and we're going to ask what happens. Uh, and actually, here I'm writing as u times v, what I'm going to analyze is actually the symmetric case of u times u, um, but it's really just a, the, the non-symmetric case is actually a special case of the symmetric case, because if a non-symmetric problem, I can always encode it on the um, uh, off-diagonal blocks of uh, symmetric metrics. Uh, so the symmetric problem actually already encompasses also the non-symmetric problem. So we're going to limit ourselves only to the symmetric problem. Uh, and as I already mentioned before, then roughly what's going on here is that the um, uh, that the uh, that at least if we start uh, close enough to to zero and we take step in small enough step size, then the solution we get is going to converge to a minimum nuclear norm uh, uh, solution. So to make this a bit more uh, formal, then uh, again, we're going to look, move to the continuous limit here. So the continuous time limit, and now gradient descent, self gradient descent, we're going to talk about gradient flow. So gradient flow on u, which is given in this form, and I can expand this out. I'm going to go through this a bit uh, quick because, actually, I'm curious. How many, um, just, so, just to decide which of the three topics I have, I'm going to skip. How many people have already uh, seen this? Or maybe, maybe I should have differently. How many people have not uh, seen this and would like to see it? 
Okay. Okay, so the compromise and kind of do it with double speed and half detail. Because uh, <laughs> I want to get to the tangent kernel stuff as well. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, so the thing is that these are the grand dynamics in U, and we can also talk about the induced dynamics in W. So again, this is something we'll see later on. Remember that, I mean, U is the factorization, W is the resulting matrix. Okay? So the dynamics, I can ask what are the gradient dynamics in U imply on W. These are not the gradient dynamics in W. Nevertheless, they're still well-defined dynamics in W. Okay? In particular, here I'm writing and just plugging in uh, U, but since U transpose uh, U is just U, I can just substitute W here, and I can write the dynamics in W purely in terms of W. So I can forget about U and just say that doing gradient, so the gradient descent on U corresponds, you know, the gradient flow on U corresponds to some other dynamics on W. So again, you can see this just as, instead of th thinking about it as, oh, I'm doing gradient descent on a different parameterization, I'm just optimizing W with respect to a different geometry. Okay, I'm doing, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm following a different dynamics on W, a different notion of local geometry on W. Okay, and I can then ask, I mean, this is going to find, if this finds the global optimum, I get it now, it's non-convex, and somebody asked me before, how do I know I find the global optimum? I don't know, but if it finds the global optimum, and actually I do know, because you can prove here that under some conditions it's going to find the global optimum, but that is not for today. If you find the global optimum, which global optimum are you going to go to? Okay, and now it depends on the initialization, so we're going to, uh, for any initial W0, we can talk about what is the limit of this, uh, uh, of these dynamics, and the formal conjecture here, I'm not sure if I still should call it conjecture, uh, is that uh, for any full rank uh, W tilde, if we initialize to zero times W tilde, so initialize to alpha times W tilde and take the, the scale of initialization to zero, then the limit of uh, uh, these dynamics becomes the, uh, the minimum nuclear norm solution. Okay? So this is uh, the conjecture, and what can we do here? Well, we can prove it formally for the special case where the measurements commute, okay? And uh, e, so that's not very, I mean, it doesn't give you metrics completion. For metrics completion, the measurements definitely do not commute. It does give you uh, uh, maybe uh, um, reconstructing the metrics from, um, uh, from certain linear observations that might commute. Maybe the most interesting case here, which is still already non-trivial, is if you take the measurements only on the diagonal. So then they definitely commute. And then what this problem boils down to is an even a simpler problem that we'll return to again later, which is just a linear prediction problem. So now everything is a diagonal, so this is just a vector problem. Okay? Uh, so the measurement vex, me, is measurements A is just a metric, so we have AW minus Y, just the least square problems, but we're representing W in the strange form of WI squared. So each, instead of parameterizing the, the, the coordinates of our predictor as W, we're parameterizing them as UI squared. And, what, and so we know that if you do current uh, gradient descent on W, we're going to get to the minimum Euclidean norm solution. If you do current, what this tells us, if you do gradient descent on U, we're going to get to the minimum L1 norm solution. And that's already kind of interesting. We see that we get a different, uh, different bias for the same optimization problem just by optimizing the different parameters. Okay. Um, for general uh, non commutative measurements, the best we can do is wave our hands really widely in the air and do some empirical observations and say that it looks like we're also sort of minimizing the nuclear norm, or maybe not. What? Okay. Um, uh, but let's actually, you know something? I'm going to skip the proof of this. Uh, I'm going to say that the proof just proceeds similar to the proof we saw before by uh, uh, looking at the dynamics saying that you stay on the manifold and constructing the KKD conditions. Uh, and let me just skip all this actually because I want to uh, actually something I'll, I'll go over this. Okay. Wasn't there progress what? on this? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. There's several progresses in this that I'm gonna mention. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me just say that for the. Uh, I'm just maybe advertise this. For the non-commutative case, so what, why is the commutative case important versus the non-commutative case? So in the in the um, in the commutative case, okay. Okay, maybe I'll sort of. I'm not going to fully give the proof, but just say that in the commutative case, the important thing is in the commutative case, we can characterize the manifold the solution stays on. So the solution stays on a manifold that looks like this, that looks like WT times some exponential of uh, you know, A star ST for some ST uh, times this. So ST is actually the integral of the, re of the residuals. So you can think of the residuals as steer steering us on this manifold. But even if I forget what the residuals are, I'm still going to stay on this manifold. So this is a non-flat manifold, but it's still some manifold. And now I can say that if I stay on this manifold uh, and satisfy global optimality and the initialization goes to zero, which 
another way to think about it is they go infinitely far away to the origin in this manifold, then I'm actually going to satisfy the K condition for the minimum nuclear norm solution. So I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, but the, in the, 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 the point is that, again, the only thing we used here is that we stay on this manifold. So we actually get something that's independent on the steering. The steering is like these residuals. The residuals tell me where on this manifold I'm going to be. Okay, so think about, again, grading these standard gradient standard least squares and then least number solution. You stay in the solution spanned by the data, and wherever you are, the residuals tell you how much are you going to add each different uh, data vector to your solution. So tell you how are you going to steer on this manifold spanned by the data. Okay? Uh, and the, the argument here was completely independent on the steering. We only needed to say that we stay on this manifold. The problem with non-commutative measurements is that for non-commutative measurements, uh, then actually we can be anywhere in our space. Then now the order in which we actually take, you know, add up our, our measurements, we can, uh, you know, that we're, once things don't commute, and by adding things in different orders, you can get anywhere. So we no longer have a manifold we stay in. Okay? Uh, another way to say it is, is the solution is given by this time ordered exponential. Okay? Uh, so if the measurements commute, then I can replace these, uh, the product of expectations with expectation of a sum, and the solution is just in the, on, on a specific manifold. But one, what? But, um, uh, but once the measurements don't commute, then now I cannot do that. And the order of them is actually uh, is important. Uh, and I have to ar have some ar other argument about how the solution of this time order exponential uh, behaves. In particular, I definitely do, do, um, uh, do depend on the, um, on the steering here. So with some very crazy steering, I can get anywhere in my space. The thing is, if I actually solve this problem, if I actually, you know, do the, what I get for metrics completion problem or metrics factorization problem, I don't actually have crazy steering. I have some sensible steering. And at least at the limit, I don't get something completely crazy. I still get on something that behaves roughly as if these measurements commuted. And I don't know how to make this formal, nor whether it's true or not. OK, but let's, uh, um, so I'm, I went through this in a bit maybe less detail than I would have uh, hoped. But you can uh, find this, you know something, you can online, you can find talks of this online if you want. So uh, I can uh, get the. In a version you can actually understand. I just summarize. So this is the conjecture we raised in 2017. Uh, we still don't have a resolution of it. Uh, as I said, we have a rigorous proof when the matrices commute. Um, uh, Tengyu, who is who was here before, is Tengyu here? No, Tengyu. Okay. So uh, Tengyu and his student have uh, proof in another special case, which is when uh, the measurements are RIP and the metrics is approximate is uh, uh, low rank or pro maybe approximately low rank. No, I think it's just exactly low rank. Um, but again, then it's a bit difficult to say whether you're going through a minimum nuclear norm solution or just the minimum rank solution or just solving the problem, you know, reconstructing, because these are conditions under which you can actually exactly, the, 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 the minimum nuclear norm solution is exactly the planted solution. Our claim is even if you're in a, in a situation where you statistically cannot fit the data, you're still going to the minimum nuclear norm solution. And again, that's backed by experiments. We can run experiments where the minimum nuclear norm solution is not the planted solution or even there's no planted solution, we still go to the minimum nuclear solution. Uh, but again, we, we don't know if this is true. And then there's some, uh, there have been at least two proof attempts that I'm aware of uh, that uh, did not work out, not by us. Uh, and several attempts at founding counterexamples. It seems kind of difficult to also find counterexamples here. I, I don't actually know. At this point, I'm not sure. If, I don't have a good sense of whether this is true or not. What? Empirical counterexample. So thing, the problem yeah. is that it's very difficult to have an empirical counterexample because yes. um, the claim is what happen is this happens only when the step size goes to zero. That's not so bad, but also when the initialization goes to zero. And the problem is when the initialization goes to zero, it becomes extremely difficult to actually optimize. And we have some evidence I'll suggest soon that suggests that the initialization should go to zero exponentially exponential in the error you you're willing to tolerate. And so if you get a numerical counterexample that only has small deviation from the nuclear norm, which is what the numerical counterexample has been, so far it's not very, not very convincing. OK, but let, let's uh, continue. So what we saw so far is one deep model. But let's look to models which maybe would start looking maybe more familiar, like actual uh, deep networks. And you won't laugh at me that I'm doing uh, neural nets. So we said if I train a single uh, uh, a neural net with a single unit, so linear regression, sorry, logistic regression, that what I converge to is the hard margin SVM solution. And now we can ask, well, what happens if I actually train, uh, still talk about li uh, linear neural networks, so linear activations, but have multiple layers and you know, a bunch of units. 
And the answer is actually that's very boring because what you get is again you just converge no, no matter how many layers you have, how, how deep you are and how wide you are. If, you, if all the activations are linear and you have a single output and you train with the gradient descent, you'll still get to the hard margin SVM solution. Now, we have to just stop a second to understand what I mean by that. So what is a linear neural network? A linear neural network is just an over-parameterization of a linear predictor. Okay? So what I'm telling you now is not what the weights in the network would converge to, but those weights in the network actually represent some linear predictor. And I'm telling you what is the linear predictor that, are, that they actually represent, that they actually parameterize, what is it going to, uh, to go to? Which is really what you, behave, what you care about. How is the function computed by the network going to behave? Okay? So the function computed by the network is going to converge exactly to the hard margin SVM solution. So that's pretty boring. Okay, but what happens if instead of talking about a fully connected network, we uh, look at a still linear uh, network, but a linear convolutional network. So what's a linear convolutional network? A bunch of layer, each layer is a full width convolution. So each unit here has as many units in each layer as, as inputs with the same weights, but shifted by one. Okay, so we have all the different shifts, uh, ro rotations actually uh, of the previous layer. And all the activations here are still linear. So this still computes a linear uh, predictor, and it's pretty easy to see that you can get any, implement any linear predictor this way. So the model class here is still the model class of all linear predictors. But, uh, and now we can ask also the same question of what happens if I train this network with gradient descent? With li which linear predictor am I going to go to? Okay, so I'm definitely going to go to a linear predictor that separates the data, but, but in the underdetermined case, there are many linear predictors that separate the data. Which of them am I going to converge to? Any guesses? Maybe somebody who's not heard this talk before? Guesses? Guesses? Okay. So what you're going to converge to, at least if you have one convolutional layer, is the max L1 margin in the frequency domain. So in other words, you're going to be implicitly minimizing the L1 norm of the Fourier transform of your linear transformation. Okay, so you're going to get sparsity in the frequency domain. Now this is with one layer. If you have multiple layers, again, so for fully connected layers, it didn't matter how many layers we have. But when we have convolutional layers, if we have multiple layers, and what we converge to is we're implicitly minimizing the bridge penalty, the LP bridge penalty in the frequency domain for P equal to depth over two, two over depth. Okay? So if you have you know, 10 layers, we're getting the L0.2 regularization in the frequency domain. So again, just to appreciate what's going on here, we're getting very rich inductive bias, very rich bias. We're biasing ourselves to solutions that are sparse in the frequency domain. So, right, so this is what you'd get if you'd use a fully connected network. This is what you'd get with the depth two convolutional network. This is with the depth five convolutional network. Okay? So you're getting to, and what I'm plotting here is the linear predictor. So you get, you get sparse in your frequency domain. And we did not do that by, ne by changing the model class nor by imposing this explicitly. This is a byproduct of the fact that we're doing gradient descent on, on a specific parameterization, which imposes some specific geometry on our search. Okay, okay so this is exactly the type of phenomenon that we want to understand. Um, now, you might ask, well, why am I getting, why here does the depth not matter, and suddenly when I'm talking about convolutions, the depth does matter, or how do I get this? So really the secret here, I feel like when I, when I show this, I feel like oh, this looks like, when I show this looks like magic, and I'm now gonna reveal the, my magic trick to you, or it's actually Surya's magic trick to you. Um, so actually, what a convolutional network actually is doing, you can think of it, is it's, it's working, it's, it's as if at each layer you can apply a Fourier transform and an inverse Fourier transform that cancel each other, so you just apply a Fourier transform in the top and in the, in, in the bottom. And so really what you're doing is you're just having a diagonal network on the Fourier transform. So what's a diagonal network? It's a network that looks like this. It's a deep network, but, but with very boring connections. So the, 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 the weight metrics at each layer is a diagonal matrix. And if you use a diagonal network, not a convolutional network, just a straight up diagonal network, no convolution, no nothing, then what you get here is the, bridge, the same bridge penalty, but now on, on the signal domain, not in the frequency domain. Okay? So the difference between this and this is whether it's diagonal or complete, and if it's in these two, convolution or non-convolution, is whether you're working in the frequency domain or in the signal domain. Okay? okay, but again, in both cases here, by increasing the depth, then without actually changing the model class, we're changing our implicit regularization. Okay, so what we saw here is actually, we talked in the beginning about, when we talked about convex models, we talked about the, um, uh, the geometry of the optimization itself. So we talk about gradient descent works with one geometry, and steepest descent works with a different geometry, and mirror descent works with a different geometry. And now, I would argue that we're still talking about geometry, but the, the geometry is different. The, ge the differences in geometry doesn't come from 
the name of the optimization algorithm, I'm just using gradient descent from all of these, the, the geometry comes from the different parameterizations. So the examples we're seeing now is we're seeing examples how I'm um, looking, doing gradient descent on different parameterizations of all functions. And by changing my parameterization, I'm actually changing my, I'm not changing my model class, the set of functions I'm working with, I'm only changing this, the geometry over that function class. So here, in our metrics completion problem, our function class is matrices, and we're working on all matrices, and we're looking at it, we're working on a particular factorization of all, a particular parameterization of all matrices, which imposes a certain geometry for the local search over matrices, and that's what leads us to the minimum nuclear norm. For the, the uh, linear convolutional networks, again, we're working over all functions. This class is all functions, all linear functions. Our entire universe is just linear functions. By design, by using a specific architecture, we're not changing our, our function class. All we're doing is changing the uh, uh, the parameterization and through that the geometry induced by that parameterization. Okay, and I would argue that that's also what happens with non with uh, neural nets with, with nonlinear activations. You're essentially representing all functions. Right? That's what we said at the beginning. Okay, but the way you're what, what's important in an architecture is not what functions you're going to represent. You can represent all functions. What's important and what is the parameterization of the set of all functions? So I can also give you an example of where you can see the importance of this parameterization uh, for actually uh, a, a, a neural net with nonlinear activation. So in particular, if we look at uh, infinite width relu networks, okay? So we look at infinite relu networks with one input unit. Okay, so that's still a, a, a well-defined class. It's also pretty rich. I'm, I'm, I can model now univariate functions. I can model any univariate function, okay? So my model class is just all univariate functions. But you can now again ask, what is this geometry of the univariate functions that is imposed by this specific parameterization of all univariate functions? Right? There are many other ways of, of, of uh, 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 parameterizing all univariate functions, okay? infinite parameterization ways. In particular, I can ask what happens now. And now I, I can't actually exactly tell you what happens if I do uh, um, Gradient descent, I can tell you what happens when you do gradient descent with weight decay, but it's still, it's a very simple inductive bias, it's a very simple regularization in the parameter space, and I can ask you what does this impose in the function space. So it turns out that what this imposes in the, in the, in the function space, when, when you're training, if you're training an infinite width relu network with weight, with weight decay on the weights, this corresponds to learning a function by implicitly minimizing the integral of the absolute value of the second derivative, so some kind of, some kind of uh, second order total variation of the function. So this is very rich and kind of natural inductive bias on the class of functions. I mean, if you're trying to learn a univariate function and want to regularize it some way, this would be a very sensible regularizer to choose. But here it's coming again implicitly by the choice of parameterization. So what we're, what we're seeing here when they talk all the time about, geom uh, about geometry, really it has two components. What we really care about is the geometry of in, in function space. We're talking about all functions. The question is just what is this geometry over all functions? The geometry under which we're searching, and because of that, the geometry of inductive bias, the geometry of the sublevel sets that will lead to, to generalization. Okay? And we're searching in parameter space, so now we have to consider, on one hand, the geometry in function space. And that's given maybe implicitly by optimization algorithm. You do gradient descent, it it's, gives you one thing. You do steep descent, it gives something else. Okay? So you have some geometry in function space. This geometry might be fairly simple. But now what I care about is what is the induced geometry in function space. And what we saw in the last examples is how relatively simple geometry in, in, in parameter space can actually induce very rich and complex geom uh, geometry and inductive bias in function space. Okay? So by in, in the role, under this interpretation, the role of the architecture, the role of the model, is not in specifying the model class, but rather in specifying this parameterization, and so specifying the geometry in this model class, which is anyway the set of all functions. Okay, okay so um, let me, I, um, 15 more minutes? Okay, so, uh, so in particular, so this, um, so let's look at it a bit more. And in particular, I wanna relate this uh, to uh, what I'm going to try to do in the remaining 15 minutes is also relate this a bit to the kernel view that J is Jason still here. Actually, I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you soon because I don't actually completely know what I'm talking about here. Um, so the how this relates to the tangent kernel view of things. So let's recall what we did and formalize it a bit more. So we said that we have a model. What's our model? A model. So I think of a model is a mapping from parameters to functions, right? So a model maybe all functions or linear functions, something like that. So you can think of it as also, split. so you have a model class, the model class is the range of f, but the, our model class is gonna be everything. It's gonna be very boring, okay? Uh, 
And um, in, in particular, we're going to write it as fwx is the output on input x with parameters w. So this is going to be the function we're going to work on and talk about the loss of some parameters w. And, uh, and right, so the model maps from here to here. And, we're, and, um, and for linear models in particular, our functions are going to be linear functions. And so we're going to use, uh, we can really talk about the model is mapping some w to b of beta w, the linear predictor parameterized by, by the weights w. Okay? And that's if we're going to talk about your uh, um, models. And now the question is, can we, um, can we give a, 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 a general theory that relates uh, the, um, the, that, um, uh, that relates, uh, okay, sorry. It's, 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 okay. so, so in particular, the type of models we're going to talk about are uh, dehomogeneous models. And you should think of the, so what's a dehomogeneous model? So a dehomogeneous model is a model where if you multiply the parameters by some c, the model gets multiplied by c to the power of d. And you should roughly think of d as your depth. Okay? So one homogeneous models are just models, linear models, not linear in x. I don't care about linear in x. All, are, my, all my examples are going to be linear in x, or almost all of them. Uh, but they're models that are linear in w. So these are very boring models. These are, these are the shallow model, models. We know we understand them pretty well. Okay? Um, examples of two homogeneous models are, for example, matrix factorization and two-layer neural networks. So both of these are two, uh, two homogeneous. In general, if I have a d-layer uh, linear network or a d-layer ReLU network, I have a d-homogeneous uh, model. So you can roughly think of the d as, as the depth of your model. Okay? And we can ask the question, can we analyze, have a general theory for d-homogeneous models? And the answer is uh, sort of. So if we at least consider uh, gradient descent, um, oh, sorry, maybe I, let me just go back and tell you what the question I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, answer is. So what we're trying to understand is in all, uh, sorry, I, mean, I think I missed an important sentence before. Uh, in all the example, uh, in all these examples that we saw here, in all the examples that we saw here, then what's really going on here is that the geometry in parameter space is very simple, just Euclidean geometry. And the geometry that we're getting, I have quite a slide on that. Okay, sorry, I think I lost the slide. And the geometry we're getting here is very complex. So now you can ask whether all this implicit, uh, implicit bias business really just boils down to having you, gradient descent imposing Euclidean geometry here. And really, I, I shouldn't have given the entire first half of the talk because I just have implicit geom uh, Euclidean geometry in the L2 space. And it's all just about the mapping to function space. Okay? And so we actually have a result that kind of suggests in some sense it's kind of the case, uh, but we'll critique it. So what we can say is if we consider a dehomogeneous model, and uh, so we have a, a dehomogeneous model with the x plus, and we're doing, we're doing gradient send on the x plus for a dehomogeneous model, then in fact, under some conditions, what we are going to converge to is exactly the max L2 margin solution on over those parameters. So we're going to be implicitly minimizing convergent direction to a solution that implicitly minimizes the L2 norm in, uh, in parameter space, okay? uh, subject to the output margin of 1. Okay? So in a sense, that says that, yes, that um, the implicit bias is given by just Euclidean geometry in the, in the parameter space. And the rich inductive bias we see in function space is just maybe a mapping of that. So that suggests that um, what we get in, now what we care about really is function space, is the implicit bias in function space is given by minimizing this uh, uh, implicit regularizer. And what is this implicit regularizer? It's just the minimum uh, Euclidean norm cost of representing H using our model. Right, so just the cost, you know, if, if I'm having this parameterization, every function would have a different cost of representing it, where the cost of the function is just the Euclidean norm in, in parameter space. So this is just the, the moving from this parameter space to function space. The problem is this is not so clear. So first of all, this, con this uh, theorem has uh, a bunch of conditions that I'm not sure if they're satisfied, actually. So we assume that the predictor converges in direction. We have to have some other things that converge in direction, some constraint qualification. I mean, it's probably you can waive many of these, but maybe that's one concern. A bigger issue here is that note that all these problems are non-convex optimization problems. And what I'm telling you is that you're going to converge not to a global minimum here, because I can tell you that's non-convex optimization problem. 
no, this is generally non-convex because f is non-convex, but rather to a first order stationary point in parameter space. The problem is that being in a first order stationary point in parameter space does not mean that you're in a first order, you're also in, fir, in, a, in the, the induced function is uh, also a first order stationary point with respect to the problem of minimizing the induced regularizer. Okay? And so that, for, because of that, for all the examples we showed, in particular like the convnets and, and all of that, Morally, this is what's going on, but actually you have to prove specifically that you actually get to a first order stationary point of this in this regularizer, okay? And it's not, I actually, yes? Does D play any role? So D doesn't play, for this statement, D doesn't play a role. Well, D equals one is trivial, okay? So only, we do need to have to be homogenous, but it doesn't matter for what depth. What D determines is the, the, the it, it of course has a role in determining R. Okay, what? I was going to say. Yeah, so R, R here is a function of the, of the model. And roughly speaking, if you're in depth D, you'd get something that corresponds to a 2 over D, over D norm. Very roughly. Okay? Uh, ju just a second. I, wanna, I see that I'm already in that. Okay, let me just finish this. So, um, so, uh, so we, we see, in fact, that in many of the examples, the rich inductive bias we, we saw we could completely explain just by this view of having Euclidean norm in the function space and just in terms of uh, what it induces in, in uh, sorry, Euclidean norm in parameter space and what it induces in function space. And we have this generic result that, it, that suggests it's true also more generally. But actually, I think that there's much more going on here. First of all, this generic result uh, has all these conditions that it's, I, it's, it, they might not really always hold. And in, Transitioning from, this, from uh, first order stationary points into problems is, is problematic. But more than that, this is only for dehomogeneous problems. And it's, you know, when you move to non-homogeneity, you definitely, we know that you get things that are much, much richer. And even for homogeneous problems, for squared loss, it seems that this, for example, doesn't work. So there's a very recent uh, work that's going to be an archive, uh, I was told, in a few days uh, by Sanjeev Arora and students. Um, that showed that for the same kind of um, di deep diagonal, and particularly implies for these deep diagonal networks that we had, that we saw that we are, we'll be getting the, L, uh, with X plus, we're getting this bridge penalty, then with the squared loss, you still get uh, L1, uh, implicit L1 regularization regardless of the depth, which means that you're starting, you get very different things. What you're getting is not given by Euclidean norm regularization here. And actually, this is not going to be coming soon because I think I'm not going to have... Uh, Time. So right now, this is to me one of the questions now I'm interested in, really understanding what's going on here. Is all the story about implicit bias just about Euclidean geometry here and this inductive bias, which is still very interesting and rich? Or are there things that are much more, much more interesting going on where the inductive bias really is very different, like if you do uh, uh, very different in here. And again, we have lots of examples in which I, the examples I showed you, it is the same, but we have lots of examples which we don't fully understand, which we see things are different. Maybe I will actually have time to show you one of these. Okay, maybe I'll, I will try 10 minutes for now? Five. Five. <laughs> Six, wait, my watch this is. Okay, so, okay. so one thing that's been bothering us lately is all this tangent kernel stuff. So what I mean by all this tangent kernel stuff, so as Jason said, then in a certain regime, then uh, gradient descent on our model behaves just as if uh, uh, we're working on the linear model. And this suggests that gradient descent just converges, so we're just, it's a, it's a linear problem. A linear problem, we know exactly what gradient descent converges to. It converges to the minimum Euclidean norm solution. Or in particular, but remember, this is not Euclidean norm in parameter space. This is now just Euclidean norm for a linear problem. And this suggests that all the inductive bias uh, boils down to is just minimum norm solution or max margin solution with respect to some uh, uh, norm in some, uh, uh, in some linear space. So some kernel norm with respect to some kernel, namely the tangent kernel initialization. From my perspective, this is a very uh, disappointing uh, uh, answer because this suggests that the only thing you can do with neural nets is the same thing you can do with kernels. In other words, if you're learning using a fancy neural nets using all your GPUs, then that's equivalent to just doing SVM with some kernel or kernel ridge regression with some kernel, kernel logistic regression maybe. Okay? And we know that kernels, there are many things you cannot do with kernels. In particular, you would hope that there are things you can do with neural nets you cannot do with kernels, or at least you know, neural nets empirically have been much more successful than with kernels. So some people maybe would answer, yes, actually everything you do with kernels, we just have to come up with the right kernel. But to me, it seems that the, the power of neural nets really goes beyond just kernels. So wh what's going on here? Um, so one way, uh, so one thing we've been thinking of is, 
is the kernel regime really the important regime? And an important distinction here is, so there are many parameters that control whether we're in a kernel regime or not, and one parameter I want to focus now is the scale of initialization. So in particular, um, we'll focus on dehomogeneous models, and we're considering gradient flow for dehomogeneous models, where we change the, what, the only thing we're going to change is the scale of the initialization. So we initialize to alpha times W naught for different alphas. And, um, uh, and uh, we can ask when would this behave like the gradient flow dynamics on the, uh, on the kernel. And at least for squared loss, uh, uh, Chizat and Bach recently showed that the width there is not important, even, even with finite width. As long as the initialization goes to infinity, okay, if, where is it? Uh, if the initialization goes to infinity, then you will always be in the kernel regime. You'll behave exactly like a kernel. So this suggests that to be in the kernel regime, you have to, the initialization has to go to infinity. Now, uh, and so when in particular initialization goes to infinity, all you'll be doing implicitly is minimizing some norm and some, uh, some RKHS norm for, for a, a kernel that's the tangent kernel. Now, the important thing is to contrast it with all, our, with all of our results. All of our results for the squared loss was when the initialization goes to zero. Okay? So this suggests that there's an interesting transition here between the kernel regime, which happens when alpha goes to infinity, in the truly deep or rich regime, which goes when alpha goes to zero. Because we saw that when alpha goes to zero, we get inductive biases, we get, sorry, we get implicit biases of the optimization that look nothing like a kernel regularization. So we, go, we, look, we get things like nuclear norm or, or bridge penalty or sparsity, which are things that cannot be represented using a kernel. No kernel can represent them. So they're definitely not the tangent kernel. Okay? So can we understand this uh, more specifically? And okay, maybe you consider this as an advertisement because I'm not going to be able to go over the details. But um, to, to answer that question, we considered a very, very simple two homogeneous models. You can think of it as a depth two model or you know, diagonal network uh, of depth two. So this is in particular just a reparameterization of a, a linear regression model with squared loss, where we, we parameterize the coefficients as w plus squared minus w minus squared. Okay? So this is kind of similar to the squared parameterization before. The reason I have here w plus and w minus is I can get both positive and negative uh, parameters. So I really, I can say I can get any linear predictor here. And also, maybe more importantly, so I can initialize at zero. What does it mean initialize at zero? I can't initialize w at zero because that's a saddle point. So I initialize w as a scaling of the all ones vector. So you can initialize all the parameters to alpha. But that means that the prediction at initialization is zero. Okay? And now, um, uh, what's going on here? So we know that as alpha goes to infinity, I'm going to be at the kernel regime. And the tangent kernel here is easy to calculate. The tangent kernel is just given by it's four times the standard inner, the standard inner product kernel, which means that all is, if I ask what is the limit of gradient flow as alpha goes to infinity, the answer is it's just the minimum L2 norm solution. Okay? But we also know what happens when alpha goes to zero. When alpha goes to zero, I said before that what we converge to is the minimum L1 norm solution. Okay? So we see that just by changing the initialization, we're in two very different places, minimum L2 norm solution and minimum L1 norm solution. Now, the interesting thing here is we can actually characterize exactly what happens for any alpha. So for any scalar initialization alpha, we exactly go to the minimum Q alpha solution. So we have an explicit uh, uh, regularizer here. In this Q alpha, I wrote here exactly what it is. It's the uh, hyper entropy, it's called sometimes, regularizer. I mean, the minus A, we can write it explicitly. And I can show you what it is. It's just, this is the, the it's uh, minimizing the sum uh, over all the coordinates of the coordinate divided by alpha squared uh, of a function q that looks like this. So what's important about this function is around zero, this is quadratic. So when alpha goes to infinity, I'm only interested in the behavior around zero, and I'm essentially going, doing L2 regularization. When alpha goes to zero, I'm only interested in the behavior away from zero, where I'm essentially linear and I get L1 regularization. Okay? But it can actually characterize exactly what happens everywhere in between. In particular, I can look at the induced dynamics here and actually, what's, you know, what, is the, what are the dynamics I get? I can write, it turns out I can write the dynamics on beta in this form. So let's see what's going on here. If alpha is, is uh, zero, then this is just uh, beta times the gradient. These are just uh, multiple weight updates. So I get exactly, I mean, I know that's going to be, be L1. When alpha goes to infinity, then this term is constant, and I just get gradient descent dynamics, gradient flow dynamics. But I can see exactly how I transition between those two regimes. And um, in particular, if I think of how this relates to learning, so imagine you're solving a sparse regression problem. So if you're solving a sparse regression problem, so we're solving a problem in like very high dimensions, a thousand dimensions, with a sparsity of five and about 100 observations. So I can solve this problem, okay? I, 
It's two minutes. Okay, I can solve this problem, but so to solve this problem, I have to do L1 regularization. Okay, and now I can ask, what happens if I solve this problem by by training my, my neural net with different initializations? So if my initialization is close to zero, I will actually be able to solve this problem. I get small generalization error because what I'm doing is essentially minimizing the L1 norm. Okay, once I increase my my alpha, I'm going to be essentially doing L2, uh, uh, be minimizing the L2 norm, and I'm not going to be able to solve my problem. So in particular, where do I want to optimize here? So I want my alpha, I want to be over here because I want to solve my problem. But the problem is over here, I'm starting in, in a saddle point. This is very difficult to optimize. So in terms of statistically, I want to be with alpha as small as possible. The smaller the alpha, I get better generalization. But optimization-wise, I don't actually want to have alpha that's super small. Okay? Because then I'm, it's going to take me forever to escape the initial saddle point. So I actually want to use an alpha which is as large as I can, but still allows good generalization. Okay. And the thing is that that alpha will depend, so I always want to be kind of not in this deep regime, but just at the, on the edge of it. I just want to be you know, exactly in this phase transition. So for this reason, I'd argue it's very interesting to understand exactly this transition between the kernel regime and the deep regime. Okay. In particular, I can ask all the, the following question. How, what happens when I have more and more data? The thing is that if I have more and more data, eventually I'll be able to learn even with L2 regularization. Right? Once I have more than a, a thousand data points, I can learn you know, without any regularization at all. Okay? If I increase, so if, my, my, if I'm really data starved, I really have to have alpha to be minuscule. Okay? But as I increase my number of data points, I can afford being, uh, learning with a larger alpha. So what we're showing here, as I said, as since we said that we always want to be on the edge of this regime, we can ask the question of how, sh how small do we have to initialize in order to get recovery as a function of the number of sample points. And this is the graph we get. This is the informational limit. And to, to recover an information limit, alpha has to be minuscule, it has to be exponentially small. Uh, but once we even have a bit more points than that, we still cannot recover with the L2 norm, but we can actually use a very moderate value of alpha. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm not going to have time to show this because uh, Seb is going to kill me, but let me just say that I can, uh, I can, we can also ask questions, what's going on here, just, just can we uh, describe in terms of explicit regularization, so is all this just a thing equivalent to minimizing the Euclidean norm to initialization? And the answer is I can also tell you exactly what happens if you just minimize the Euclidean norm to initialization, and what happens is completely different, because you again get an explicit regularizer, but this explicit regularizer, this is the, the solution from Quartic, it's a much nicer explicit regularizer, uh, it's uh, in particular it's algebraic as opposed to transcendental, and so the behavior here is very is is qualitatively different between doing the implicit regularization and just doing minimum Euclidean norm parameter space. If anybody understood that, you should get a prize. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me. Uh, yeah, what? Can I get a prize? <laughs> 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 it's cheating. Okay, <laughs> okay. So um, uh, I can say that you can see that all those phenomena also on metrics, uh, on the metrics factorization problems. You can also these, see this transition, with I think Jason also alluded to in particular. Okay, I'm not I, I'm not going to go to Jason. Okay, this is uh, later. I earlier lost all of you anyway. Okay, thank you. Let's keep the questions offline. You can grill uh, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs>